Now this is a painting in our uh, EMS Museum uh, collections, from the EMS Museum collections. This is a very early refinery, I would, I would think. You can see the oil wells here, and they're refined. Uh, the oil is refined right at the site, which is essentially distillation. You can see this must be the distillation tower. You can see the furnace here with the chimney to heat the crude to the required temperatures and then collect the fractions. Uh, at the time was kerosene, obviously, for lighting. And then later on, maybe light uh, gasoline. You can see the storage tank, maybe for the gases and, and so forth. So last, in the last lesson, we've talked about thermal cracking processes to make more of the lighter stuff, essentially. Uh, light distillates or gasoline from the crude oil by breaking chemical bonds. And we mentioned that uh, pretty soon the uh, thermal cracking processes could not meet the demand for quality. And what has changed in the meantime, when we have now uh, close to the Second World War uh, era, where the motors now, engines, have higher compression ratios, and they would require higher octane number gasoline. That means they would need gasoline that would not ignite spontaneously with pressure, and it is pressurized with air. That's essentially what the octane number uh, measures, its anti-knocking property. So most catalytic processes, catalytic conversion processes, were developed right before and during the Second World War, uh, mainly for making higher quality, higher performance fuels and in higher yields and higher quantities. So introducing a catalyst to crack the crude oil into gasoline boiling range uh, is not done just to increase the rate of cracking or has anything to do with kinetics, really, that's what catalysts typically do. In this case, introduction of the catalyst changes the whole chemistry of cracking. Now, we have talked about having neutral uh, reactive species, free radicals in thermal cracking processes. In catalytic cracking, the reactive species are ions, or cations, actually, carbocations that are produced on catalyst surfaces. So we need uh, acid catalysts, typically alumina, silica, or zeolites, in order to create these cationic species. Why do we need that? Because carbocations go through isomerization reactions very fast. That means we will have now an opportunity to make branched alkanes or isoparaffins because of this isomerization of the ions as opposed to non-isomerization of the free radicals. Isomerization in free radicals is very, very slow, so it doesn't, doesn't happen. So uh, pretty much uh, all gasoline production in the U.S. is done through catalytic means. Uh, fluid catalytic cracking is really the most popular process. It is the heart of a refinery in the United States, FCC process, that generates high octane gato, uh, cat, uh, gasoline. It's a very flexible process. It could use uh, a range of feedstocks in the gas oil boiling range all the way up to light vacuum gas oil. For uh, heavier materials, something like uh, heavy vacuum gas oil or vacuum distillation resid, we need to introduce hydrogen so that we could convert these heavy fractions without rejecting uh, larger quantities or very large quantities of carbon. Then we get into hydrocracking processes. So in this lesson, we will go over the historical development of catalytic cracking processes ending up, of course, with FCC, which is universally used and accepted now, and talk about the hydrocracking processes, some of the uh, conditions that are necessary for treating this very heavy ends of crude oil into upgraded products without rejecting carbon, so in higher yields.